What's going on? This is Nick with Techno Warriors TV, and welcome to another amazing UFO related interview. Today, we have someone really, really special for you on the show today. We have Colin, and what's your last name? Saunders. Saunders. We have Colin Saunders. He has had some absolutely insane UFO sightings. This is the UFO sightings of Colin Saunders. He also has a book out, which is really, really cool. Now, due to time constraints and everything, we aren't doing another. We aren't doing an author interview as well. He just wants to do an interview about the UFOs and stuff. But we have so many chop. This thing is going to be absolutely phenomenal. I'm really, really excited. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please remember we did suffer a uh, another crash, a YouTube server crash. So we did lose quite a few videos in this uh, YouTube server crash. Not as many as the last one in 2021, but we lost quite a few and we're still working on getting those videos back up. So please bear a moment if your video was taken down. I'm working hard on getting it up again or refilmed. Also, as you know, uh, we do have another cool video coming. Uh, we have um, the UF we have the MUFON, direct, we have the next interview for MUFON, it's uh, Brian Lindley, he's a UFO, he's a MUFON director for Utah, we're going to have his interview coming up soon here, and we also have a pair of head, uh, earphones that we're reviewing soon, so stay tuned for all those, we've got a lot of chock full stuff for you to, that's coming up down the pipeline. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited to start the UFO sightings of Colin Saunders. If without further ado, welcome to the Techno Warriors TV YouTube channel and welcome to the show and take it away. Good morning, Nick, and uh, thank you for inviting me onto your show. It's uh, a lovely day here in the UK at the moment. I know it's early morning over there for you. Uh, so thanks for bearing with me and um, let's get straight into it, shall we? Yeah, let's get straight into the biscuits and gravy. He has had some absolutely insane UFO sightings. And the UFO, one of the UFO sightings he has had is so intense that he has made models of it. And you can see that on your screen right now, seeing in back of him, it's just some of the models of the UFO he's, he's seen. So tell us about some of the UFOs you've seen. Okay, well, to start off with... Um... It's best to say that, you know, prior to the sighting, I had no interest in UFOs at all. So I wasn't a member of any UFO groups. I wasn't looking for a UFO. This thing just came out of the blue. Um, and also, I mean, prior prior to the sighting, I want to quickly run through my working career. It won't take long, but I believe it has such an, an importance on the sighting and on the models that I've actually made. Now, I've spent most of my life, well, all of my life, as a draftsman. So I draw. I draw for a living. I've always drawn. But notably, I've worked overseas, not just in the UK, but I've worked in Germany on the European Airbus, on the A300, the A320. And I spent um, two years working in Sweden for Saab Aerospace, working on civilian aircraft as an electronics draftsman. Um, I've also worked in New Zealand. I had 18 months over there. And then I've also worked for Chevron Petroleum, in Scotland, in Aberdeen. Um, that was quite an important job because we did a lot of, well, quite a bit of offshore work. Um, so there were a lot of flying involved with helicopters, etc. And also, when you go offshore, you need to make proper drawings and proper records of what you've seen. And when you go back onshore, you draw it all up. But you haven't got a second chance to go out again, so you've got to make sure you get it right. So you train to make sure you check it and check it again. You've got all the information that you need before you leave the platform. And that sort of training came invaluable on the night of the, the UFO, to take in all the much detail as I could. And as soon as I got back home, I started drawing it and then started making models. So to go to the actual sighting, it was the 31st of March, 1999. It was my mother-in-law's birthday. She was 72 that day. And there was two car loads of us. We set off. We went to a small village in the Warwickshire countryside 
called Paleton. Now, it really is in the middle of nowhere. There's no street lights, no nothing, no lighting at all. Uh, the roads are completely dark. So we left the pub at um, nine, about nine fifty. Nine fifty was the time of the sighting. And as we left the pub, I remember looking round. My wife was driving. Um, sitting next to my wife was my mother-in-law, and in the back of the car was myself and my daughter. And as we drove off, I remember looking around and seeing the second vehicle, the Range Rover, with my brother-in-law helping the old uh, French lady into the car. He'd got a French partner, so his gran her grandparents were over for the weekend, and we all went out for this particular meal. Um, so as we left, I remember looking around and seeing the second vehicle and seeing the old lady struggling to get, get into that. And I thought, well, they're going to catch us up on the way home. And off we set, going through the country lanes. Like I say, it was pitch black. And we came up to a road called the Foss Way. Now, this is an ancient Roman road. It's a straight road. Um, and as we turned onto the Foss, we, we said, somebody said, like, we're turning onto the Foss now. And my daughter said, oh, there's been talk of headless horsemen down here. So we all laughed and said we'd keep our eyes open for him. And as soon as we turned onto the Foss Way, there were these lights hovering by the side of the road. I mean, there's no other street lights again down the Foss Way. It's just pitch black. And there were these lights, the brightest lights I've ever seen in my life. Red lights mixed in with a bit of white. And we all go, what on earth is that like? It was exactly half a mile away. I went back and measured the distance the next day. So we drove towards these lights, talking about them, all excited. And we, we more or less drove underneath them. They were like 100 feet away from us. And when I say 100 feet, I mean 100 feet. I'm good with distances. So we stopped the car and we were staring at these lights. And there were four big red lights at the back of this thing. But there was no craft at this point. The craft, strangely enough, was totally invisible. All we got was lights. So we stopped and we were looking at the lights. Now, there were four big red lights on the back of the craft. Now, this is um, a model here of the final model I produced. But to show you what I mean, the, the craft had four big red lights at the back and it was tilted at an angle to the earth. It wasn't parallel with the earth. It was actually tilted up slightly. And it was tilted slightly that way as well. So you can see a bit of white underneath and the red lights underneath as well. But like I say, at this point, there was no craft at all. So we'd stopped the car and we were staring at them. And I was staring at one particular light, this one here, the highest one of the tilt. And this light here, it got like a crisscross effect on it, a bit like a, a lens on the traffic lights. But you could see the effect was coming from the light source. So it was like Newton's law of ring interference, where you got peaks and troughs, and it was leaving a pattern in the light itself. It was amazing to look at. And as we were staring at these lights, then all of a sudden the sky started to ripple around the lights. And I thought to myself, my God, it's not just lights, there's something there as well, there's like a craft. And as soon as I thought that, the, the craft materialised, it decloaked. Uh, I'm sure you must have seen um, Star Trek, you know, when the Klingon ship just decloaks in front of you. Yeah. This is what happened to us, like we were just looking at it and then it decloaked in front of us. And it became this solid metal craft. Now, what it did then, as we're looking at the um, the rear end, like so, well, as soon as it materialised, it floated up in the air. But it floated like a submarine underwater. It didn't move like a Harrier jump jet. It sort of floated like hydrogen, or best way to describe it is like a submarine underwater. But the nose rose up in the air like that. Now, it was that close to the ground. If it tilted from the middle, I believe it would have struck the ground. So the rear end stayed where it was, and the nose came up like that, like a stallion rearing up in front of it. It showed as the top surface of the craft here. Now, we could see this top surface here, the grey, was like liquid, like liquid mercury. Now, if I get this close to the camera, you can probably see we've tried to recreate that effect on this, this model here. I don't know if you can pick that up. But the surface was like liquid, not liquid, well, like a liquid, like liquid mercury running up and down the surface. But then on top of these beams that were interlocking, the silver beams, it was just absolutely incredible. And I remember thinking, as the nose rose up in there, I remember thinking, my God, aliens exist, abductions must take place. And this explains some of the mysteries we've had in history from all 
centuries ago, like pyramids and things. Those sea forts came straight into my mind. Then, my wife being sensible, she's the driver, she decides to pull forwards and reverse into a gateway, which is more or less underneath where the craft is hovering. But as she pulls forward, there's a big hedge and it blocks our view. And I thought to myself, if it's going to go, it's going to go now. And sure enough, we reversed into the gateway, jumped out, and it had gone. But there, in the distance, going away, was another craft with four big red lights at the back. But this one was massive. It was like the size of a football field. Wow. It was, it was going away from us. This, and it was at a bit, a bit of a distance, probably half a mile, but it looked absolutely huge. And because it got the four big red lights on the back, I've never seen that on an aircraft before, and I've seen plenty of aircraft in my time. I've been worked in the aircraft industry and been to different air, air shows. You could tell straight away the small one. You could tell straight away it wasn't from this world. It was like it was like meeting God. It was incredible, and the feeling was incredible. Um, now there's a little bit more to it, but I'd like to come back to that in a bit. This is what we call the strange, high strangeness that took place. Um, for the first 20 years of the encounter, I've talked about the nuts and bolts of what took place, of what I've just told, told you now, but there is a bit more to it, which I've started talking about recently. And uh, like I say, I'll come back to that shortly after we've gone through a bit more of um, the experience. But So once, um, once we stood there and realised it had gone, and watched this big one going away, we got back into the car, and uh, drove home. We checked the watch. It was 9.50 p.m. And the, during the course of it, there was no other traffic, no airplanes, nothing. And it was, when we got out of the car, it was deadly silent. It was so quiet. You could hear a pin drop. So we got in the car. Like I say, we checked the watches. It was 9.50. Uh, we don't know exactly what time we left the pub, but we don't think there's any missing time. And we set off back home. Now, the strange thing is, when we got back home, the second vehicle was already there. And we don't know how it managed to pass us without him seeing us or or them not seeing the, the craft. It's all very strange how that occurred like, and we were quite surprised. Not only was the vehicle back, but the occupants were out and inside the house. And this is the old lady, you know. So they must have been home some time prior to us. So whether they, they, there was a possibility they passed us while we was in the gateway without seeing us, but we've got the hazard flashes on. And if that had been the case, surely they would have seen the craft as well. So that was all very strange. So we got back home. The first thing I did was start doing drawings, the same as I would do if I'd been offshore, and started creating all these images. Um, <clears throat> and my daughter did a drawing. Now my wife, who um, was sensible and driving, she saw the lights, stopped the car next to the lights, but she didn't see the craft materialise. It was only the other three of us, my mother-in-law, my daughter and myself, who saw the craft materialise. Um, me and my daughter drew the same sort of pictures and then my mother-in-law described it as being triangular with girders on the surface was her, her description. So what I did then after doing the drawings, I, I could be in a draftsman, it was obviously natural I'd, I'd do some drawings, I did some sketches, then I used AutoCAD um, to do some drawings. I have in fact in the past in 1992 I was AutoCAD user of the year in the UK, so I do know about computer aided design and how to use it. And um, then I did some drawings on coral photo, coral draw, um, and then I, I printed those out and stuck them onto a model, a built a model. I decided to make the first model I built was made with um, dowling, and I just stuck the images onto the dowling framework, so it gave the shape of the triangle now. Strangely enough, I, um, my, I had a van that I was using for work from home. It was broken into one night and the stereo was stolen out of it, but so was the model. I don't know why anybody would want to pitch the model, or, or even the old cassette player, to be honest. So what I did then, I decided to build a second model. Now I've got that one here. This model's about 20 years old. Um, and I put a battery pack into this and some lights, so it all flashes away. Um, now the interesting thing, we never ever saw the bottom of the craft. We only ever saw the rear view and the top as it rose up. And then you never saw the bottom? No. But what happened was um, I got in touch with a guy called Omar Fowler, who specialised in triangles. 
he sent me some information and he sent me a drawing of the bottom of a triangle that was seen in Belgium back in the 80s. Now, the thing about the drawing of this triangle is all of these lines were in relief are coming off the surface on the bottom of the triangle, just like the ones that we've seen on the top of the triangle. So I decided to use the bottom sighting from Belgium to make the craft and to mix it with my view of the, the rear and the top to make the perfect triangle. So we never actually saw the bottom. The bottom may well have just been flat for all we know. But I have a feeling it was probably the same as this craft that's been in Belgium. So it's a similar sort of craft. So what I'm there, but that, the problem with this one is there's no liquid surface. It's just grey surface. So it doesn't really show. And these lines are not off the surface. They're just printed on the surface. What happened then was a friend of mine bought himself a 3D printer. And he said to me, said to me he wanted to... Um, print my UFO for me. I thought, that's great, because at last we can get the raised beams on the surface. So this is like one of the early models. I oh, it's so cute. It's so adorable. And we've put, uh, obviously, lights inside it. Um, let's put the centre light on as well. There we go. So that's the underneath of the craft. And then, as you can see, we've copied the Belgium site in with the lines in relief on the bottom. Oh, that's cool. And then on the top, we've got the lines in relief from our own sighting. Again, this is brilliant. You know, I couldn't believe it when he made this model. Yeah, it's pretty crazy that you can do a 3D printing. I mean, it's just like it's, you know, the technology is just absolutely insane these days. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? And for me, as a draftsman, making a model like this makes it far more tangible. You know, once I've got models, I could go to presentations and talk about what I'd seen. And you can show drawings, you can talk about it, but to show a 3D model, whether it be the first craft I built or this 3D printed model, then um, it makes it far more tangible. People can understand what you're talking about. Now, this little model took a bit of um, bit of work and it cost a bit to manufacture. Now, all the time my friend made this for me, he never charged me anything. It was all done free of charge. Um, and I came up with an idea. I said to him, I've put these on Facebook, now you've got all the files for printing them. I can sell these, not on Facebook, on their eBay. And if I sell enough of them, will you make me a large model with a liquid surface? And he agreed, he said, yeah, you do that. So we started selling these on eBay. And I showed him a website where there's some fantastic drawings of my craft, done by a guy in Belgium. He did some fantastic images for me, which I've, I've sent them to yourself actually, with computer generated images. Now, whilst John, the manufacturer of the triangle, was looking at the triangle on, on there, he also decided to build um, a cigar-shaped UFO and a saucer-shaped UFO. The saucer-shaped UFO is in the background there with all the lights on. So you can see that that's um, based on a UFO landing in Germany. Oh, wow. So that's a little flying saucer with all the lights around it. Uh, so we sold a few of those as well. And then... He made me this. This is the big model. This, so this is the is big the kahuna. This is it. This is about an A3 size model. You can see the liquid on the surface. Hopefully you can see that. And ladies and gentlemen, if you if you are in a smaller device like a telephone or a tablet, um, it might be hard to see, but if you're on a big computer like an iPad or a desktop or a laptop, yes, yes. just go ahead and go full screen and you should be able to see it better. Just look at that UFO. I mean, what he saw was just absolutely insane. Just the detail of what it looks like. Yeah, the detail. I mean, people say, how do you remember it so much? Even now it feels like it occurred yesterday. It doesn't feel like it was like 24 years ago. It feels just like yesterday. But one of the things is, I mean, my training as a draftsman has meant that I managed to um, remember a lot of detail about the craft and also getting back home and drawing and starting to build it straight away helped me to uh, capture the the night but I think it's like anything that's really traumatic in your life it stays with you I mean even now after 24 years it, it just feels like it happened yesterday it's incredible so what I did next I decided to go to a uh, UFO conference here in the UK and take the model with me 
I did say to John, the manufacturer of the model, that if he'd made it, I would go out, out on the road again and show a few people what, what he's done like. And at this conference afterwards, I mean, people thought it was fantastic. Um, one of the guys suggested I write a book. And I, th I had thought about that, but I thought I'd wait until I retired. I'm not far, far off retirement. I'm 65 now. Uh, I've got another year to work. But I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll write a book. Now, I started writing the book. I wrote about my own experience. And um, the problem was it was only <laughs> got to about 20,000 words. You need like 70,000 words to create a book and have it published. So what I did then, over the years, lots of people have got in touch with their own sightings, most of them triangular sightings. So I started to put those into the book. And then I also reached out to people in the uh, social network, you know, social media network, um, and people were coming back with sightings they've seen. So I put all of the sightings into the book. So we've ended up with um, 130 different close encounters in the book here just purely in the UK and that um, that is phenomenal you know and every every one of them is different you know when people say is this um, a back engineered secret military craft well if it was we'd have one or two of them we wouldn't have 130 different shapes different sizes and different colors of a single craft you know that just doesn't happen when they build things like the stealth fighter and the stealth bomber they're all the same, you know, they don't change it from one to another. You certainly don't have 130 different varieties because trying to keep those afloat and maintain them and spare parts would just be phenomenal. But obviously somebody somewhere is doing that, but not. Uh, it's not from this world. Now I say that because that is the nuts and bolts of what happened. That is the story of our encounter. But there is a little bit more to it. And this is the high strangeness that I want to go back to. Because for the first 20 years, I didn't talk about this. I just talked about the nuts and bolts. But what happened on the night, when the craft tilted up in front of us like this, and I was staring at it, and I was thinking, oh, my God, aliens exist. All of a sudden, it was like somebody got a pair of binoculars and put them in front of my eyes because I could see the surface really close up, sort of about that close and I could see oh, wow. the interlocking lines then I got this view a view of the nose and it was so close I couldn't see the lines on the surface anymore just a big round nose and then a side view showing the central white core and the top and the bottom were rolled over like hovercraft skin you know what I mean like like the edge of a pastry on a pie they were both rolled over top and bottom onto the central core but there were no nuts and bolts no rivets no welding the whole thing had been amazingly put together, sympathetically assembled, almost like it had been moulded, but they were dissimilar, dissimilar metals. It was an incredible piece of engineering. And then um, I remember being in the car saying, stop, stop, I want to get out. Uh, me and the mother-in-law wanted to get on board. We would have done that night. I think my wife and my daughter were a bit nervous, but my mother-in-law were so excited by it. So the next day I'm talking about it. So I said, like, you know, this is close view nerve. I think I've had an out-of-body experience. That's the only way I can figure I got close to the craft to see all the detail. I don't think we were taken. It doesn't seem logical. I've got no memories of anything like that. And that's what I thought. So for a long time, I was thinking it's an out-of-body experience. Now, I went to um, a UFO conference 20 years ago here in the UK. We had some great conferences then. And I met a guy called Bud Hopkins. Now, I'm sure many people in the States will be aware of the late Bud Hopkins and the work that he did with um, UFO abductees. But I managed to get um, a conversation with him in, here in the UK. There was a line of people queuing up to chat to him. I told him about the experience, told him about close viewing. He said to me that it wasn't um, an out-of-body experience. He says they were images placed in your mind by... The aliens on board the craft. And I thought that's a bit odd. Um, telepathy with aliens, and I didn't really take it on board as such. I thought that's a, a nice theory, but but I'm sticking with my um, out of body experience. But I made a note of it. I wrote it down on the list of things that were starting to happen. Um, because what happened next was I was starting to have um, paranormal experiences. 
uh, up until the sighting. And I'd be about 40 years old when we saw the craft. And I had no paranormal experiences whatsoever. No ghosts, no nothing. And it all started with the UFO. Now, after the UFO event, I started to have other paranormal experiences. Um, strange like this, seeing lights in the sky, uh, hearing things and seeing things here down on the ground. And um, I, the most extreme one I'll tell you about, because this is going to sound really odd, because so far I've talked about nuts and bolts, and now we're getting into the weird paranormal stuff. But I was fishing, I love fishing, I was standing in the river fishing away, and I was in a field on my own, nobody else around, and I heard these footsteps coming towards me. Now, I assumed it would be people, farm workers down there going shooting and whatever, so I decided to climb up the bank and make myself known, because they didn't want them shooting in my direction. But I climbed up the river bank, nobody there, but the footsteps are continuing. And I stand wow. there, and it's, it's coming towards me. And I think, this could be a big cat. Because, you know, in the UK, people have had big cats, you know, like tigers, lions, pumas, and they've let them go into the wild, you know, when it become uh, difficult to keep them anymore. They just let them go. So we do have wild cats roaming around. And I thought to myself, this is a cat, and it's coming for me. So I, and I was really frightened. I have to say, this is the only time I've been frightened in the whole of this UFO stuff. I mean, the, the actual night when we drove up to the craft, that wasn't frightening at all. It was totally the opposite. It was fantastic. But this cat, this, what I thought was a cat, coming towards me. So I've got a big spy cat and rod holder all that I use for my umbrella. And I was going to use that to protect myself. Um, but this thing walked right in front of me, right? From left to right, it could have been no more than six foot away. And it was totally invisible. But I could hear it, just hear it. And then it went off. So I started clapping my hands and chasing after it to see if I could flush it out. But there was nothing there, nothing came out. And I stood there and I thought, well, I've heard it. I couldn't see it. But I don't think it's here. I don't think it's here right now. It, whatever I'm listening to is somewhere else. Like in a, and that was the day, Nick, that I decided on that, that particular moment that the UFO was not extraterrestrial at all. It's not come from another planet. It's come from another dimension. And the reason I say that is because I'm starting to have all these other experiences after the close encounter with the UFO. Nothing prior to the UFO. So that links the UFO with these paranormal experiences I'm having. For me, yeah. especially the one at the river, that was 100%, you know, um, not here. So 100% dimensional, I think. And ladies and gentlemen, as you know, we cover tons of stuff like paranormal on the paranormal hauntings. We've interviewed paranormal teams. We've interviewed um, an exorcist. His name is Sal Feng. So big shout out to him. Big shout out to our one of our sponsors, uh, Ricoffa Tees and Bovis, and Stone Paranormal. Uh, big shout out to Christopher Newhart and Gwendolyn Allen. So big thank you guys. Thank you so much for your support. Also a big thank you to Brian Brian Lindley from the Mutual UFO Network. We're going to have him on the show. Um, also, um, just a big shout out to everyone for your support. A big shout out to um, Collins. What is your last name again? Saunders. You're struggling with that name, aren't you? Saunders. Colin Saunders. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Colin Saunders. It's going to be you know hard to get used to that one. Colin and Saunders. ladies and gentlemen, Triangle you, UFOs of the United Kingdom by Colin Saunders. Yep, and Colin Saunders, I will put his book where you can buy his book in the link in the description. So go ahead and check out this, his book. I also put it in a pinned comment where you can get his book. It is an awesome, awesome book. Now, um, normally for someone who's had hauntings and paranormal experiences, we do a separate video. But just for time's sake, he wanted to include it in this interview. Um, tell me about some of the other UFOs you've seen. Uh, a lot of them have been at distance. There was nothing quite like uh, exciting as the first encounter. That, that was just incredible. But um, I, after that, I started watching the skies all the time. I um, started seeing lights moving around. I went on an astronomy course so I could figure out what were satellites and what were planets. So I got a good idea of what's floating around in the sky up there. And I did see quite a few. Now, I've listed them with the dates and times, but, but also 
other weird things like um for instance i had a splat on top of my head when i was sitting outside in the garden of the pub waiting to play darts with the darts team on a thursday night and i remember saying oh no some birds just pooed on my head and i put my hand up but there was nothing there was a definite big splat and i didn't think anything about it that was on the thursday but on the saturday when i'm building this first hand-built model i come out of the shed in my garden and there's this splash again on top of my head, splat, just like a bird pooped on it. But there's nothing there. Again, I looked up in the clear blue sky, so it wasn't a raindrop or anything like that. I went inside the house, made a cup of coffee, came back out again, and again, splat, top of my head. So I had three separate occasions I've had these splats. I don't know what they are, um, but I don't think they were normal. I don't think it was like a nervous twitch in the top of my head or anything like that. It was a definite feeling of something hitting me. I know it sounds weird, but I assume it's some sort of download that's been sent down from from above, like. And I can only imagine that was to make uh, make me get on and make the model, create the model. It's the only reason I can see um, this occurred. I mean, I have to say, I don't think we was in the right place at the right time. I think they were waiting for us. I think it had all been planned and executed, um, and executed extremely well. And uh, I don't know why. I thought it was to create the model then I thought maybe it's to write the book I, I don't really know what it's all about but maybe I'm some part of some sort of um, subtle disclosure project so one of the, the people who are writing in with their own sightings I started to ask if they've had any paranormal experiences and um, more people were saying yes than no so they were telling me like they'd seen ghosts and this that throughout their lives before they'd seen the UFO so what happened then in the end there were so many I've got a whole section in my book a whole um, chapter dedicated to UFOs and the paranormal, to people who have had paranormal experiences as well as UFOs, which just shows to me, absolutely confirms to me that these things are dimensional. I mean, recently we've had this whistleblower out, haven't we, this David Grush, who's been ex-military talking about uh, crash retrievals. Now, what he says, in, if you listen to his, um, his talk, he, he was saying that... Uh, they're not um, from another planet. He's also saying these are dimensional creeds and dimensional craft. So that is where, where I'm at. This is what I think. They are definitely dimensional rather than extraterrestrial. But what I did every time I had an experience, either seeing a light in the sky or splats on the head, thing down at the river, I made a note of it and kept a list. Um, I don't think I sent you a copy of that, but it's all in the book. I've written down everything that's happened to me after the UFO event. One of the strange things to note is that all the people who have had um, paranormal experiences seem to have had them when they were younger, and it builds up and builds up to a UFO experience. That seems to be the uh, culmination of the paranormal stuff. Whereas for myself, mine's... Um, only occurred after the UFO experience. I had nothing prior to the UFO. So for the first 40 years of my life, nothing. But then over the next few years after the UFO, I had quite a few experiences. It lasted for a couple of years. It's quietened down now. I do see things occasionally, but nothing like I did at the beginning. But to sort of round it off, what happened was I had an email out of the blue. Um, and I've put the email in the book, and it's the only non-UK sighting and it's a sighting in Connecticut in America now the guy got in touch with me and he said that he'd, he'd seen me on YouTube and he says just like you I had three images placed in my mind by those on board Triangle during a close encounter so he was saying the same thing that Bud Hopkins was saying so this guy in his email he says that he was in his car and he saw this triangle it came down eventually, got really close to him, and as he was looking at it, all of a sudden, he had these three close-up views, these three images placed into his mind. The same that happened to myself, three images. Um, and it's when I was reading his email that, that sort of the penny dropped. It was like a, a eureka moment. I thought, that now makes sense. Bud Hopkins was right all along. It wasn't an out-of-body experience. It was actually three images placed in my mind by those on board the craft. So that would explain why I didn't see the craft roll 
you know, when I said I seen seen the nose and then I seen the side view, I didn't see it roll in between the two. It was like one snapshot and then another snapshot. So there were three snapshots: one the close up of the beams on the surface, a snapshot of the nose, and a snapshot of the side view. And I realised then, like I said, that Bud Hopkins was right. I believe now that the images were placed in my mind by those on board the craft, or even the craft itself, because I must admit the craft looked like it was organic. It looked like it was alive, even though it was clearly manufactured. Now, that would also explain why only myself has gone on to have all these other experiences after the UFO event, because I was the only one who had the telepathy. So my daughter, my wife, and my mother-in-law, they didn't have any close viewing, and they didn't go on to have any other experiences after the UFO event. It was only myself. So I'm linking the fact that I had these closed views to the other paranormal stuff that's happened to me after the event, if that makes sense. So the, the, the crux of it all is really, and I was thinking about this earlier today, I've, I've written this book with all these different sightings in, but what I really wanted to say in the book was that during our close encounter, I believe I had telepathy with an alien. <laughs> that took quite a bit of um, taking on so board. So you had communications with an alien entity? Yes, that's what I believe now. Through three images placed in my mind, three close-up views. And I believe that was done on purpose to enable me to build a model. You know, without the close-up views, from our perspective, where we saw the craft tilt up, we would never have seen the side view. We would not have seen this milky white central core and the top and the bottom rolled over, like I say, like a hovercraft skin. No nuts and bolts along here, no rivets, no welding, no nothing. Now, without those close views, I would not have been able to build this exact model. So I believe it was done on purpose. I believe they were waiting for us. Um, it, it may even have been a bit of an ambush because... Because my wife, um, the one who didn't see the craft materialise, when I asked her to draw what she did see, she drew three red lights in a perfect equilateral triangle. Well, there's no way we could have seen that from where we were in the car. And, you know, the other three of us didn't see that because all the lights were mingled in. So there is a possibility that whilst we were staring at the little triangle, the big one we seen afterwards was actually coming over the top of the car. And what my wife maybe saw was the underneath of the, the mothership, the large triangle, the football field shaped craft with three lights in the corner because that's what she drew, three equal actual red lights. So that might have been the case. It might have been like a distraction, a little one. Also, a big one came over the top. We can only guess. We'll never know really will we, what took place. But um, it certainly changed my, my view of the world. It's been quite amazing, life-changing. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Colin for Saunders. being Saunders for being on the show today. If you want to hold up your book for the outro, there we go. Uh, it's the Triangular UFOs of the United Kingdom by Colin Saunders. It's available on Amazon, uh, paperback, hardback, Kindle, and there's an audio book as well. And so, so, and ladies and gentlemen, I'll link to, to everywhere you can get this book. It's been such a treat to have you on our show today. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like this video, you know what to do. You hit that like button if you like this video. You hit that dislike button if you hated the video. And if you adored this video, all you have to do is strangle that subscribe button, slap that like button in the face, and pow, right in the kisser. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Nick. You have a wonderful day, too.